Hello, class. So let's review the last reaction that we talked about. And that's where we took a acid chloride and we treated it with lithium aluminum hydride. Remember that? So when we did that, what did we generate? We first generated the aldehyde and then you used another lithium aluminum hydride and you made the alcohol after you did the second uh, acidic workup. That's what we did. <clears throat> but you recall in the video previous to this one that I said, what if we wanted to stop at the aldehyde instead of going all the way to the alcohol? Can we do that? And yes, we can. It all has to do with what reagent we're using so instead of using lithium aluminum hydride, which you can see lithium aluminum hydride looks like this. We already know what lithium aluminum hydride looks like. Let's take it and then replace a few things with it. So we will have a hydrogen and then you're going to do put these terp-butoxy groups on it. So you put an O, O, and another O, like that, okay? So this is gonna have a negative charge, and that's analogous to the lithium aluminum hydride, because what does a lithium aluminum hydride look like? You can see that it has four hydrogens, and in this reagent, we only have one hydrogen. So, so these two reagents behave very similar, but the kicker is that this reaction right here is more controlled, so we can isolate our aldehyde. So this guy has a name, <clears throat> because we're going to have our... How do we want to write this? Typically, it's written like this because it's lithium aluminum. And you can go OR. So this OR right here is these three groups right there. Like that. So this species right here would be called a lithium aluminum. No, lithium tribe. Tert eutoxy. So we have one lithium triterputoxy aluminum hydride. So that's a bit of a mouthful. But lithium tributoxy aluminum hydride is this species. Now, what does, why is this so important? <clears throat> is because when you treat the your acid chloride with this species right here. That is a three, okay. And then that's step one and then step two. You have your aqueous workup. What are you going to generate? You are going to stop at the aldehyde. Now, realistically what's happening is can this reagent react with an aldehyde? Yes, it can. But the reagent here reacts much faster with the acid chloride and really, really slow with the aldehyde. So when you do this reaction, you're monitoring it. And so once your aldehyde product is formed, you already stop the reaction before the <clears throat> the hydride species can react with the aldehyde, but it does it, 
but it reacts with aldehyde so slowly that you can isolate this and get that in good yield. Okay. So that's how we can, so put that in your toolbox. How do you make aldehydes? Acid chlorides with lithium tributoxy aluminum hydride will give us our aldehyde. <clears throat> the next reaction that we want to look at is acid chlorides reacting with Grignard reagents. So when you take a generic acid chloride and you treat it with a Grignard, magnesium Br right there, and step two, you're going to have a, an aqueous workup. What you're going to generate is a tertiary alcohol because we have our R. And we're going to add the other R right there. So if I put that R prime, R prime, and then what do we have here? So this oxygen is that oxygen. But guess what? Greenyard reactions add twice. <clears throat> So it takes two molecules of the Grignard and it adds the first R and then it adds a second R group. And so you generate a tertiary alcohol. Now the mechanism to this <clears throat> is very analogous to reducing acid chlorides with lithium aluminum hydride. So if we look at the mechanism. Here's our acid chloride. A Grignard could honestly, you can take a Grignard reagent and kind of translate it to look like an R minus. That's what's happening, right? <clears throat> so you could view it like in two ways. You could look at it like this, in which this bond right here comes in and attacks like so. And what's that going to do for us? That's going to get us our tetrahedral intermediate. O minus. This is our chloride and this is our R group. Just like that. Or you could very well have envision the Grignard like this, and it would have done exactly the same thing. It would have just attacked like so. So however you want to view the Grignard is fine by me. If you just take this and represent it as the R minus, that's fine. So now we're at this point. Let's distinguish our R's though. We're going to call that the R prime so we can see where the R's are coming from. Now what do you think the next step is going to be? Well, we have what? Three lone pairs on that oxygen. So if we bring those down, we can kick that off. So we would have our chloride and then we would have what? we would have generated a ketone. But guess what? It doesn't stop here. Grignard reagents are very, very reactive. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have another Grignard come in. We could represent it like this. That's going to come in form our tetrahedral intermediate right there. But when you look at this, we have our R prime there, O minus, and then 
this r prime that I just drew this guy is now from that guy. Can this lone pair collapse back down and kick something off? It can't because the three R groups are not good leaving groups. So what do we have to do? We have the second step in the reaction, which is simply a aqueous workup in which you're going to uh, do the proton transfer with some water, or you could have a little bit of acid in there, and that's going to do the proton transfer. So if you have a little bit of acid in there, what do you have? You're going to have the hydronium, right? And so then the proton transfer step would simply be this. And that will give us our tertiary alcohol. And there's our product. So this mechanism is very, very similar to the reduction of acid chlorides with lithium aluminum hydride. The next reagent that we're going to look at is called the Gilman reagent. Now what's similar between the Grignard and a Gilman is they are using metals in the reagent. And in a Gilman, you're going to use copper instead of magnesium. And so that's going to have some, it's going to influence its reaction slightly differently than the Grignard, just based off of the metal that is being used. So that's what we're going to look at next. Now before we get into the Gilman, I want to review with you If you take a alkyl halide and you take the alkyl halide and you treat it with two moles of lithium metal, what you're going to get is the R lithium plus the lithium bromide. Okay. So this reagent right here is called a lithium alkyl reagent. Alkyl lithium reagent. And that alkyl lithium reagent, you could just represent that R lithium bond like this. That is simply a R minus. So the alkyl group is nucleophilic. You can now take your alkyl lithium reagents, okay, and if you take two of those and you treat it with some copper bromide like that, what you're going to generate is a species that looks like this. You're going to have copper in the center, and you're going to have two alkyl groups on the side like that. And the copper is going to be negatively charged. So that's going to, uh, that whole species right there is negatively charged, and it's going to be paired up with the, the cation, which is our lithium right there. So we call this species our excuse me, <clears throat> our lithium dialkyl cuperate. Make sure I spell that right. So that reagent right there is our lithium dialkyl cuperate. That is a mouthful. And the person who's in charge of discovering this is Gilman. So that right there is the Gilman reagent, and that's how you make it. Now you can take this reagent right here 
and simplify it down to a R minus. See how alkyl lithium is an R minus? And then our Gilman reagent is an R minus. To remember, if you take a alkyl halide, let's do that in a different color. Remember, if we take a alkyl halide and treat it with solid magnesium in some ether, what do we generate? We generate the Grignard. Grignard reagent. And what can that really look? How can we simplify the Grignard reagent? We could say, hey, that is a minus sign. Okay. So they all look like R minuses, but the Gilman reagent behaves a little differently. So let me show you an example of how it reacts a little bit differently, and then we will talk about why it reacts a little bit differently. Okay. So we have just seen that a acid chloride reacting with a Grignard. So if we just do a generic Grignard, we call that R prime. Step one, step two, we have some workup. What's our, our product going to be? It's going to be a tertiary alcohol. Remember that? Okay. But in contrast, if you take the same acid chloride and treat it with a Gilman reagent, which is what? R prime, copper, R prime. That's negatively charged, like that. Okay. <clears throat> and you treat it with that, what are you going to get? you are going to get the ketone. It, the Gilman reagent does not add twice to the acid chloride. You can see in the Grignard that this R prime has been added twice, but in the Gilman, the R prime only adds once. That's the major difference between the two. Now, why is there such a major difference? And that has to do with the charge distribution. Let's see here. Where did that information go? Right here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's find a different marker. So if we compare the three uh, reagents that I've been talking about, and I refer to those three, the alkyl lithium, the Grignard, and the Gilman, as organometallic reagents because they have metals in them. So if we look at the alkyl lithium reagent, what do we have here? We have a R lithium. And then if we have a Grignard, we have an R magnesium Br. And then we have the cuprate or the Gilman. Like that, right? Now I'm going to complex that with the lithium right there. Okay? Because we know that the lithium is positively charged and the copper is negatively charged. But I'm just going to show those complex together and so we don't need to show the charges. We know they're there because <clears throat> they're both ionic there. Okay. So what, why does the Gilman only add once and the, the Grignard add twice? Well, it has to do with the electronegativity difference here. 
when we take a look at the electronegativity difference between, let's say, the this complex right here has a electronegativity of 1.9 and the electronegativity of the alkyl group is 2.55 okay now let's do the same thing with this guy this is 1.31 and this one is going to be 2.55 and the lithium here is 0 0.98 2.55. So those are the electronegativity values. And when you take the difference between these two, so 255 minus 0.98, it's going to basically help us understand how polarizable this bond is. And since this, this difference when you subtract these two numbers, is really, really large, that's going to say, hey, we have a really large partial negative there and a really large partial positive there. When you take the difference of this number, you see that it is smaller. And then the difference here is even smaller. So what are, what are we observing here? That this whole group translates into a R minus. This turns into an R minus. And this turns into an R minus. Yes. But the amount of negative charge on that R minus is different. And since the Gilman right here has such a small amount of negative charge on that R group, it is not as reactive as, say, the Grignard. So the Grignard, because as more partial negative, it's more reactive, hence it's going to react twice. Gilman, not so much, so it only reacts once. Okay? So you got to be careful in the fact that the Gilman, yes, it does have two alkyl groups here, but only one of them adds, okay? And in the Grignard, we have only one alkyl group, but it adds twice. So when you do this reaction, you're going to have this at a minimum of two equivalents, typically in excess, because you can see that it adds twice. Right. So the next thing that we want to look at is how do we make acid anhydrides? Let's take a look at making acid anhydrides. So what you typically do is you start with a acid chloride and you're going to take a carboxylate and that carboxylate can be whatever you like let's make it look like this so that's a carboxylate and that's going to be under a sit or basic conditions so what's going to happen here Mechanistically, once I draw the product, can you see it? What the mechanism is going to be? So the product looks like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Do you see how this piece right here? came from there, and then this piece right there came from that. So can you see the mechanism of what's going to happen? 
we can take our acid chloride and take our carboxylate like so. We can envision that it's going to attack like that. So what's that going to give us? We'll have an R. And I'm going to put the O right there. And that is attached. One, two, three, four. Like that. We have our O minus. That O minus is coming from this oxygen right there. And then what else do we still have attached? We still have our chlorine. So that's our tetrahedral intermediate. So we need to kick off that chlorine by bringing down the lone pairs and then making that leave. So that's going to give us our chloride and then our product. Just like that. Pretty straightforward mechanism. So after we make our acid hydrides, how do they react? What kind of chemistry can we do with them? So the reactions of acid and hydrides, this is going to be quite easy. When you look at a acid chloride, versus an acid anhydride. Really, what is the difference between the two? It is the leaving group. Acid chloride has that as the leaving group, and then that as the leaving group. So every reaction that a acid chloride can do so can an acid anhydride. So for example, if we want to take uh, acid chloride and treat it with a alcohol, oh, an alcohol, and recall that because hydrochloric acid is formed as one of the products, you have to add the pyridine to clean that up or neutralize it. So what would the product be for that reaction, we've just formed a ester. So if you do the same reaction conditions for the acid anhydride, but now the difference is that because you don't have the chlorine atom in an acid anhydride, you're not going to form the hydrochloric acid. So you don't need the pyridine. But what do you generate? The exact same product. So all the reactions that we've learned for acid chlorides are going to be the same for acid anhydrides. So there's no need to go through all the mechanisms and all the reactions because they're the same. Okay. So now what we want to take a look at, let's see here. We're going to look at some anhydrides and how they react with certain species. So here we looked at forming an ester. We're also going to take a look at a amid. Okay. So let me clean the board and we'll take a look at that. So in organic chemistry and in biology, peptide chemistry, we have this term called acetylate. You want to acetylate something. And a prime example of acetylation is when you take salicylic acid. And this is the molecule that is found in the willow tree. 
that people have used for centuries for treating pain. But we've noticed that salicylic acid causes some stomach problems. So what they did is they discovered that if they could acetylate this OH right here, it would kind of reduce those stomach problems. So acetylation takes place when you treat your alcohol with acetic acid. Not acetic acid, acetic anhydride. And you will acetylate the alcohol. And so what we're going to get here is acetylation of the alcohol to look like that. Do you see how all we've done is taken this group right here and placed it on there? We've acetylated the salicylic acid. Now what's that, what does that, how does that change that molecule? Well, we have the acetyl salicylic acid. Let's take a look at something. So we have acetyl salicylic acid. And that is known better to us as aspirin. So that's what you're doing, or that's what, I don't know if, that's what I've done in my organic labs. You take salicylic acid, you do the acetylation, and you can generate your own aspirin. You can also acetylate with, with amines. What if I have this compound right here? And H2, and we treat it with acetic anhydride. We can also acetylate amines. No, no, no. Got to make sure we have the nitrogen there. So we've selectively acetylated the amine. Now we don't need to worry about how they selectively acetylated that and not the alcohol. That's not the point of this discussion. It is to show you that acetylation can happen on alcohols and amines. And here's an acetylation event. And so what do we have here? This is Tylenol. So these acetylations are very prevalent in the drug industry, but acetylations on proteins is another way that our body can tell proteins what to do. So an acetylation mark can say, hey, turn off DNA transcription. Or if you acetylate another protein, it could say, hey, turn on DNA transcription. And there's just an array of different uh, functions that acetylation can do in the body. And you're going to learn more about that when you take biochemistry. Acetylation on proteins has a major effect on what happens inside a cell. So next, we will take a look at how to prepare esters. And then there's a famous named reaction called Fischer esterification, in which you are generating an ester. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. So let's take a look at the preparation of esters. Now we have already seen this reaction, right, where we take an acid chloride and treat it with an alcohol 
and some pyridine, and we're going to get our ester. We'll call that prime. All right, we've seen that reaction already. So if that works with the acid chloride, then you would definitely believe that if you took an anhydride and treated it with an alcohol, and now you don't need to use the pyridine, what are you going to get? You get the same ester, right? Now, let's talk about some reactions that you haven't seen yet. Let's say you take a carboxylic acid. If you take that carboxylic acid and you treat it with sodium hydroxide, what do you think is going to happen? That's an acid, that's a base. So we are going to generate the carboxylate. And then if you take that carboxylate and you treat it with, let's say, a very simple alkyl halide, like methyl iodide, we could see a SN2 reaction occur in which we would get that ester as our product. So that's one way to uh, make ester. So we could generalize it like this. An alkyl group and a halide would give us that. Now this reaction is done in two steps. You have step one and step two. And this is done under basic conditions. But what if you want to do acidic conditions? What if you take a carboxylic acid and you treat it with, let's say, methanol with a little bit of acid present? When you do that, you will then also get an ester. And this one right here, when you take a carboxylic acid, treat it with an alcohol under acidic conditions, that has a name. This one at the bottom is called a fissure. And I mis already misspelled it. There, that looks better. Fisher esterification. That is a named reaction that you just got to remember what it's all about. You, you will see that on standardized tests for sure. So let's go in and take a look at the mechanism behind this reaction. Do you need to know the mechanism for this one in green? Yes, you do. But that one, I know you can do on your own. This first step is a deprotonation or to get our carboxyl carboxylate. And then we do a SN2 to give us our ester. So make sure you know the mechanism for this one. Now the Fischer esterification mechanism, I'm going to clear the board and we are going to go through that mechanism together. Now let's take a look uh, at the overall reaction. So this will help guide us in knowing what to do. And let's use methanol and we have a little bit of acid present. Okay. So what's that going to do? That's going to get, this is a Fischer esterification reaction. So that's going to give us this as our product. So what's the first thing? Well, we have methanol and acid. What happens when you take water and add some acid? What do you generate? 
you generate the hydronium, right? Well, it's kind of the same, it is exactly the same thing now with methanol. When you add your acid, what are you going to generate? You're going to generate this species, like that. So what we have going on here is we have our MEOHs right here. So that's going to be our first step. It's going to do a protonation. And so the first one is going to be lone pairs here. OH, double bonded O. So what's the formal charge on that oxygen now? That's going to be a positive. And then what did we generate? We generated our methanol back. Okay. Now what's so good about that? Why do we want to protonate that? Because now it has activated that carbon nil carbon. It has made it more electron poor. So now the lone pairs on our methanol here can come in and attack like that. So what does that do for us here? <clears throat> now our textbook shows that these are reversible and they are okay. So every mech or uh, yeah, every reaction in this reaction is going to be reversible. Okay, so what what's our product here in Earth? We have our R O H still there. O H, and we just added this guy. O Me still there, and we still have the hydrogen directly attached to the oxygen. And now I see an oxygen atom with three bonds, so that's positively charged. Just like that. Okay. Then we're going to have another proton transfer. We're going to have another methanol molecule floating around because that's methanol is the solvent as well. So there's just a lot of methanol around. So we're going to have a proton transfer to give us that. Oh, Emmy. And what else did we generate? Our ME. Like that. Okay. So what's what what's our overall goal here? We want to get rid of an OH. So we need to take this OH here and grab that proton. And what's that going to do for us? It's going to turn the alcohol into a good leaving group. Now that's positively charged like that. So now we can, and then we generated some more of our methanol. So we can kick this guy off by a little bit of help with these uh, lone pairs. They can come down like so and kick off the water. We have a double bond O H like so. 
So are we there yet? When you look at that and look at our product, do you see how we're so, so close? And what can we do? Well, we have, we've generated some methanol over here. So that methanol can come over and do a proton transfer. Just like that. So we got to our product. So you notice that we are under acidic conditions. Do you see any anions or any negative charges? Well, you don't, because if you did, then that doesn't uh, bode well with the conditions that we're in. If you're under acidic conditions, you can only have neutral species and positive species. And that's what we have shown here in the mechanism. So the next reaction that I want to talk about is a fun one because many people have done this reaction in their own homes. It's called saponification and it's just a fancy way of saying making soap, which is really cool. So I'll clear the board and then we can talk about that reaction next. So the reaction that's called saponification is just a fancy way of saying how to make soap. Now this reaction of saponification, we will talk more about it during class as how it relates to making soap, because I think that's fun. But for this part of learning it, what's happening here? We are taking a ester. We're taking that ester and we're under basic conditions. Sodium hydroxide is basic, so we're under basic conditions. And what are we doing? We're taking an ester and converting it into a carboxylic acid. So here's another way to make carboxylic acids, saponification. You need the second step, the acidic workup, to make the carboxylic acid, and that will be explained when we take a look at the mechanism. So if we take this, what's the first step? We have sodium hydroxide under basic conditions here. What's going to happen? Hey, that guy's negatively charged, is it not? So it's going to come in and attack the carbonyl to give us our tetrahedral intermediate. Like that. The negative charge is going to collapse back down to kick off the OR group. So that's going to give us that plus our OR minus. Now when we get to this stage right here, You see we have a what? A carboxylic acid and a base. You cannot stop those guys from reacting with one another. So you're going to have a proton transfer. And when that happens, it's basically irreversible. Technically it's not, but for all practical purposes, it's basically irreversible. And you generate the carboxylate plus the, the alcohol. And so that's where the next step comes into play, where you have to do a step two.
which is the acidic workup. That's a positive charge right there. Why do we need that? Because this guy needs to come and do a proton transfer to generate our product. So there's our carboxylic acid. And that is done under basic conditions. Now in the next video, we are going to talk about converting a ester into a carboxylic acid under acidic conditions. Okay. So that's where we will stop for today. Okay. And as always, if you need anything, have any questions, just let me know.